So I haven't been doing content on a regular basis on the channel. I know, I know. I've been really, really busy. But I've really found some time to actually squeeze in a video too. And here's one video that I decided to make for you guys. Grab a piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at hemorrhagic disease of the newborn. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such amazing content every time I post. Grab your piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. So remember that when you talk about hemorrhagic disease of a newborn, it's just simply a syndrome where you have this systemic bleeding and ecchymosis that's going to be appearing in the first week of life, predominating in breastfed infants. There's a big reason why we see it much more common in breastfed infants versus those that are bottle fed. I'll talk about the reason very shortly. And the incidence is about one in every 200 to 400 neonates that are not given vitamin K prophylactically. So just a differentiating picture between ecchymosis, which looks like a bruise, and petechiae, which are pretty much pinpoint hemorrhages. So this is what ecchymosis looks like. This is what petechiae look like. So remember that most of the vitamin K that we get is pretty much coming from natural foods that are high in vitamin, vitamin K contents that is relative to what the body actually needs. And when it comes to vitamin K, it poorly crosses the placenta and has a maternal infant gradient of 30 to 1. So this poor transfer of vitamin K from the mother to the infant. Already that's one factor that is going to be leading to newborns being deficient in vitamin K. And then after the birth, the levels are going to be depending on the diet, whether it's a breastfed infant whether versus a formula infant. With formula, they do add some amounts of vitamin K that are going to be there to supplement the requirements, but breast milk has little amounts of vitamin K. So if this child isn't receiving prophylactic vitamin K at birth, and they're just exclusively breastfed, they are at risk of developing hemorrhagic disease of the newborn. When it comes to vitamin K, it exists largely into two forms, vitamin K1 and vitamin K2. So vitamin K1 is pretty much going to be coming from the diet, and vitamin K2 is what is produced by the gut flora. Remember that vitamin K1 is found in these leafy green vegetables, things like soya beans, canola, and is also synthesized by the colonic bacteria. But again, in a newborn, the colonization hasn't yet happened by this bacteria that's able to synthesize this vitamin K. Now, what exact, why exactly do we need this vitamin K? Remember that vitamin K is needed for the synthesis of the clotting factors, the vitamin K-dependent clotting factors. These are factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. It's also needed for the synthesis of anticoagulant factors like protein C and protein S. So how does it do this? So the vitamin K actually is going to be acting by carboxylating the glutamic acid residues on the amino terminal part of the vitamin K dependent proteins, such that if this doesn't happen and there's um, no carboxylation of this glutamic acid residue, it means that this protein is not going to be able to bound, to be bound to calcium, it's not going to be able to bind to phospholipids, and in essence, it's going to be a functionally defective protein. So it means that if you don't have this vitamin K, you're not going to be synthesizing these factors 2, 7, 9, and 10, as well as protein C and protein S deficiency. Remember, if you have a deficiency in these clotting factors, this is largely going to affect the clotting cascade, and this may actually result in hemorrhagic disease of the newborn. So how exactly do we classify hemorrhagic disease of the newborn? It may be early, it may be classical, it may be late. So an early presentation is one that's going to be occurring on day one. It's quite rare and often it's going to be due to certain medications that the mother was taking that do interfere with vitamin K metabolism. So things like anticonvulsants, uh, the TB drugs, anticoagulants like warfarin, primidone, and even diphenylhydatone. Then, of course, the incidence of bleeding is going to be about 6 to 10 percent, and that's if the child is not given this prophylactic vitamin K. And then, in a classical presentation, this is going to be occurring roughly at about one to seven days after birth. It's much more common in unwell infants or those that have been delayed 
to start feeding, for example, those that are on prolonged total parenteral nutrition and those that have antibiotic use, such that you don't have this colonization of the gut by this vitamin uh, K synthesizing bacteria. So this child is going to be bleeding classically from the umbilicus, from the GIT, from any venal puncture sites, from surgical sites, and sometimes from the brain, though this is uncommon. The incidence is about 0 0.4 to 0 0.7 uh, per 100,000 births. Then in the late presentation, this is going to be roughly occurring about 2 to 12 weeks after birth. This is much more common in exclusively breastfed infants. And it may also be associated with a cholestatic liver disease as well as other malabsorptive states like cystic fibrosis. Remember, if there's cholestasis, it means that there's no proper movement of bile from the hepatobiliary system into the intestines. And remember, bile is needed for the emulsification of fat. And uh, emulsification of fat is going to be needed such that digestion and absorption of fat can actually happen efficiently. And remember that there are some fat-soluble vitamins that are absorbed from the gut. Vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, and vitamin K. And if vitamin K is not absorbed from the gut, then you can't really synthesize those clotting factors. Then half of these people that have the late presentation are pretty much going to be having this serious intracranial bleeding. And about 30% of them have warning bleedings that happen before the large uh, torrential bleed inside their brain. Then the incidence is about 5 to 10 uh, per 100,000 births. Oh, what exactly are we going to investigate for? We do our full blood count. We're very much interested in our platelet count. We order for our prothrombin time, our activated partial thromboplastin time. So generally, how you're going to suspect hemo hemolytic or rather hemorrhagic disease of the newborn is that pretty much you're going to be getting a normal platelet count and it will be in the background of a, a neonate that's bleeding. And this neonate is also going to be having a prolonged prothrombin time and a prolonged activated partial thromboplastin time. And how do we manage these infants? So if there's bleeding, we want to give them our 10 mils per kg of fresh frozen plasma and give them the vitamin K one milligram dose. But remember, this is going to be taking about 12 to 48 hours to correct because the synthesis is a bit slow. So FFP is what you're going to be giving in the interim. You're going to be giving them these clotting factors to help them in the interim and to actually stop the bleeding. Then if the mother has actually been treated with those drugs that interfere with the metabolism of vitamin K, things like anticoagulants, I mean anticonvulsants, even anticoagulants like warfarin, anti-TB medication, these should be given vitamin K 24 hours before the delivery to the mother, so about 10 milligrams of vitamin K1 intramuscular, and of course the newborn should have their prothrombin time, their partial thromboplastin time, and their platelet counts monitored for any bleeding. And vitamin K1 milligram should be given to the neonate at birth and repeated after 24 hours. Then we do sometimes offer repeated infusions of FFP every 8 to 12 hours or a drip of 1 mil per kg per hour and this should be done if any bleeding is occurring. Then for those that have delayed hemo hemorrhagic disease of the newborn, you want to give them vitamin K1, 1 milligram per week. This can be given orally for the first three months. Now just a few things about FFP transfusion in infants. Remember that the coagulation times in infants, particularly in those that are preterm infants, are generally longer than those that are in adults because they haven't yet synthesized. The liver is not so much sure to synthesize these clotting factors to begin with. The gut is not yet colonized by that vitamin K synthesizing clotting factors. So generally, this may not necessarily be related to the risk of bleeding. It's just how they are because they are still maturing and they're still developing. So an abnormal coagulation test result in the absence of symptoms of or of bleeding or any hemorrhage is actually not an indication for FFP transfusion and you shouldn't transfuse this infants with FFP unless if they're bleeding. So the routine FFP used to treat any coagulopathy in the absence of bleeding is actually not recommended and it doesn't reduce the morbidity, doesn't reduce the mortality. So what are some of the indications of FFP use in infants? It could be in hemorrhagic disease of the newborn, that's secondary to vitamin K deficiency, where the infant is actively bleeding, that's a very important thing to take note of. Then it could be bleeding or high-risk bleeding or any coagulopathy, treatment of any congenital deficiencies of single clotting factors, 
when the specific concentrate is not available and the infant is actually bleeding, or it could be an infant with a coagulopathy about to undergo an invasive procedure. Inappropriate indications include those that uh, you're giving FFP routinely, for example, for volume expansion, for hyperproteinemia, for correction of immunodeficiencies, for correction of congenital or acquired coagulopathies in the absence of bleeding, or any nutritional purposes we just generally don't want to routinely give FFP. So some absolute contraindications for FFP use include a documented intolerance to plasma and its components, congenital deficiency in immunoglobulin A, even in the presence of uh, anti-IgA antibodies, and relative contraindications include heart failure and pulmonary edema. So how exactly do we give this? So we do a full cross patch. Remember, group O FFP should not be given to infants who are not group O because there is a potential of actually transfusing significant amounts of anti-A as well as anti-B antibodies. Remember, you're giving serum to these individuals. And FFP should be thawed before you actually use it. So it comes like a frozen block that you're supposed to melt out and then keep it warm, then transfuse it. So we transfuse it at about 10 to 15 mils per kg over 30 minutes uh, using the given uh, sets that's supplied by the blood bank. And remember, you should add an extra 10 mils to compensate for the amount of fluid that remains in the giving set. For example, if a child is weighing 3.5 kg and you're using uh, 10 mils per kg as your infusion rate. So you're going to be saying 3.5 multiplied by 10, that gives us 35 mils. Then you want to add that 10 mils of the giving set that gives us roughly about 45 mils. So in essence, you can just say, let's give this child 50 mils of FFP. So remember that frusamide is not routinely used. In the prophylaxis of hemorrhagic disease of the newborn, we generally want to give every newborn baby vitamin K, one milligram IM when they are born. And this actually virtually eliminates the classical hemorrhagic disease of the newborn, it reduces the rate of late hemorrhagic disease of the newborn. For the preterm infants, we want to give them 0.5 milligrams IM or IV, and as well as parenterally fed infants and children should receive one milligram of vitamin K once a week. Some side effects of vitamin K include local effects due to the intramuscular injection, though these are rare. They may include things like infections, irritation at the injection site, nerve damage, and sometimes muscle damage. I really hope you enjoyed this lecture on hemorrhagic disease of the newborn. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel. Hit the bell notification icon so you never miss such amazing content every time I post. To Zambia and beyond, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.